Welcome back to Understanding the Foundations. Throughout the scriptures, and especially the books of the law, which are Genesis through Deuteronomy, we see many statements such as this one. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations, as a covenant forever. I understand the word forever. People frequently change their minds, but when God says forever, it is still in effect even after 4,000 years. Even the wicked prophet for hire, Balaam, recognized this when he said, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? However, notice that this verse also states that this commandment is specifically for the people of Israel. Therefore, who you understand Israel to be will determine not only how you will read this verse, but actually all of Scripture. I was taught that God had two peoples, Israel and the church. The two were completely separate, and God had different plans for each of them. I was taught that the laws found in the Old Testament only applied to Israel. However, these same preachers frequently blurred the lines between these two separate peoples. They said that we can claim the promises of blessing made to the people of Israel, even though they taught us to reject the terms of the covenant that brought those blessings. We will discuss what a covenant is in more depth in the next chapter. But for now, we need to examine the scriptures to see who Israel is and what God's plan was for them. To get started, let's examine the foundations of a familiar New Testament passage to see what they reveal. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It is easy for us to gloss over this brief passage as merely biblical poetry. However, if you heard this in the first century, you would be very excited. These two verses have incredibly deep foundations and are packed with meaning. The first half of the first verse is what God spoke to the nation of Israel when they arrived at Mount Sinai after leaving Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is huge. Peter is applying the same words God said to the nation of Israel to the church. If we continue reading, there are still more references in this passage linking the church to Israel. The second half of the first verse links the church to these familiar prophecies in the book of Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, Proclaim that His name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Yet, who were these people who walked in darkness, and what darkness were they walking in? What light has shone on them? Reading Isaiah 9-2 in context 
shows that God was speaking specifically of the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. (laughs) That may not mean much to us today, but those tribes were part of the northern kingdom of Israel. After the northern kingdom had turned their backs on the Lord and wallowed in idolatry for centuries, God sent the Assyrian Empire to destroy them in judgment for their sin. The darkness they walked in was a total gloom and despair of a people who had not only abandoned their God, but who had been totally destroyed. But what about the great light? Naphtali and Zebulun dwelt in the region which Isaiah describes as the Galilee of the nations. This is where Jesus spent most of his ministry years. To make this connection certain, Isaiah's incredible prophecy then describes Jesus, calling him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There is so much more that we could say about this one verse, but it is verse 10 which unlocks the deepest and most complex link between the church and Israel. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This verse comes from an Old Testament passage that very few people have ever read. Even Jewish rabbis avoid it because it raises questions that without the New Testament they really cannot answer. In over 40 years, I have never heard a single sermon on it, even though it is critical to understanding who the church is. She conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name Lorukama, which means no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name Lo-Ami, which means, Not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet, The number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. Throughout the Old Testament, God used the metaphor of being married to Israel, just as the New Testament describes the church as the bride of Christ. After the reign of King Solomon, God split the nation of Israel in half as judgment for Solomon's horrible sins of idolatry. The ten tribes in the northern half became known as the House of Israel, and the two tribes in the south became the House of Judah. Neither kingdom remained faithful to the Lord, and they worshipped other gods, even though they still gave lip service to the Lord. The Lord called this spiritual adultery and he described the two nations as sister whores. The house of Israel was so wicked that the Lord ultimately divorced them, and without his protection, they were soon destroyed by the Assyrians. Most of the house of Israel were dispersed among the nations and totally lost their identity. Meanwhile, despite the efforts of several good kings, the house of Judah also acted wickedly and brought judgment upon itself. Jerusalem was destroyed, but after 70 years of exile in Babylon, the Lord brought Judah back and reestablished them as a nation. True prophets have a tough life, and Hosea was no exception. To show the people just how wicked their behavior was and the consequences that it would bring, God commanded Hosea to marry a woman who would be unfaithful to him. The names No Mercy and Not My People referred to the house of Israel. Since few of us understand the Hebrew laws concerning marriage, it is easy to miss the full horror of this situation. When God divorced the house of Israel, He could never again remarry them. Thus, they could never again be His people. Yet, even amid the echoes of judgment, 
God promised that somehow they would be his again. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. The house of Israel was utterly destroyed. But even seeing this, the house of Judah did not repent of their sin. Thus judgment came on them as well. Yet, even as judgment was falling on them, God made an incredible promise of complete restoration through the prophet Jeremiah. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. As the kingdom of Judah was being destroyed by the Babylonians, their restoration seemed totally impossible. Yet, when God said, all the clans of Israel, he was promising that he would not only restore Judah, but also the ten clans of the house of Israel who had been divorced and now no longer even existed. The rabbis could not imagine how this could be possible, but God's plan of redemption was so deep that it even handled this seemingly impossible situation. In essence, the ten northern tribes were dead. Yet God promised through the prophets that they would live again. The familiar prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37 describes this. Hundreds of years later, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He also said to the Jews, that is, the people of the house of Judah, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. So who were these other sheep? Thousands of years before, the aged patriarch Jacob laid his hands on the heads of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to give them his final blessing. Strangely, Jacob crossed his hands so that his right hand, the hand of greater blessing, was on the head of the younger son, Ephraim. As he blessed them, he prophesied that Ephraim would become the greater of the two. He said that Ephraim would be the father of a multitude of nations, or translated literally, the fullness of the Gentiles. Note that Paul uses the very same phrase in Romans 11.25, which we will examine in a moment. The tribe of Ephraim was the largest tribe in the house of Israel, and the northern kingdom is often referred to in Scripture as simply Ephraim. When they were part of the United Kingdom of Israel, all twelve tribes, they were His people. Through their sin, they became not His people, and ultimately not a people. But when Jesus called His other sheep to Himself, He fulfilled the impossible prophecies of restoring not my people. When God called me to be His in 1973, I had no idea just how incredible His plan of redemption was. However, the more I understand His Word, the more I stand in awe of Him. We could look at dozens of other passages, but just from these, you can see that the Scriptures seem to be saying that we, the Church, are actually Israel. Please understand that the church is not, as some people say, a replacement for Israel, nor is it a second and separate people of God. Jesus said that there will be one flock. If that is a radical concept for you, please hold on and take the time to test it against Scripture. The word Gentiles, or goyim in Hebrew, simply means nations. Then as now, there were only two groups of people in the world, his and not his. As we read earlier, Israel was his people, and everyone else was, well, everyone else. If someone wanted to come to God, they became Israelites. Ruth, who was from Moab, understood this, and she declared to her mother-in-law, Naomi, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. 
The Apostle Paul's primary ministry was to Gentiles who were the other sheep that Jesus spoke of. In Romans 11, Paul compares the process of a Gentile becoming a Christian to a branch being cut from one tree and grafted into a different tree. This is a very long passage, so I'll shorten it here for clarity. However, as always, please go back and read the entire passage in context. I ask then, has God rejected His people? By no means. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. There is a lot to think about in Paul's discussion. But in verse 24, Paul says that when Jews put their faith in Jesus, they are grafted back into their own tree. Looking at that from another angle, when we Gentiles put our faith in Jesus, we are grafted into their tree. Like Ruth, we become part of Israel. One flock, one tree. As I said at the start of this chapter, who you understand Israel to be will determine how you will understand all of Scripture. Misunderstanding that one question is like wearing colored glasses that prevent you from seeing things in Scripture. For example, if I tried to read the Gospels in a red-letter Bible while wearing red glasses, I could see everything clearly except the words of Jesus. Since his words are written in red, they would be very difficult to see. When I was a young believer, I was taught that the Torah, the laws of God for his people, were only for the Jews before Jesus came, and that Jesus did away with the law. In so doing, they gave me glasses to read the scriptures with, which made it virtually impossible to see the things that we have been examining in this book. Now that I am daring to read the scriptures without those glasses, I am seeing things that I never saw before, even though I have read the Bible from cover to cover many times. Of course, after looking at things through those glasses for 40 years, it isn't always easy to adjust. At first, things look totally different. However, the further I walk this road, the more I realize that now I am merely seeing how incredible the Scriptures and God's plan of salvation truly are. So, am I saying that we are Jews? <laughs> no, not at all. I am neither a direct descendant of those living in Judea at the time of Jesus, nor a follower of the religion of Judaism as it is taught today. I am a Christian in its fullest sense. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God, who is born of a virgin. I believe that He lived a totally sinless life, and, in fulfillment of Scripture, He gave up His life willingly 
as a sacrifice so that I could be forgiven of my sins. I believe that God the Father raised him from the dead on the third day and that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe that salvation is a gift of God's grace and not the result of any merit on my part. I believe that he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us, to teach us his ways, and to enable us to walk in them. I believe that at the appointed time, he will return to judge all who have ever lived and to establish his kingdom on earth. I do not merely believe these things, but I seek daily to live them out so that I can honor my Lord and Savior in all areas of my life. The only thing that has changed is that I have dared to believe that I can simply accept what Scripture says without having to reinterpret it to make it agree with a set of man's doctrines, as the Pharisees did. When we tamper with the Scriptures, we strip them of their power to redeem the world. Before we move forward, I want to show you one more scripture that demonstrates two very important points. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This passage very clearly states that we Gentile believers in Jesus are fellow citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. Just as we have seen one flock and one tree, Paul states here that Jew and Gentile are now one new man. That's fantastic! However, the main reason that I mention this passage is because right in the middle of it, there is a statement that seems to totally contradict what I have been saying. Did you catch it? For he, that is Jesus, has broken down the dividing wall by abolishing the law. That verse seems to say in very plain English that Jesus has abolished the law. That would say that my early teachers were right. If Jesus did away with the law of God, it must have been a bad thing, so there is no reason to study it now except out of historical curiosity. Of course, skeptics and atheists love this passage as well because it sounds like Paul directly contradicts Jesus, who said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. This demonstrates what we discussed in chapter 1, that we must understand Scripture in context not merely the context of a paragraph or even within the context of the whole book. Rather, we must view every scripture within the context of the entire Bible. Therefore, let's pause and take a few minutes to wrestle with this verse. Then we will have confidence as we move forward. As we have discussed before, translation is never easy and translations between vastly different cultures spanning thousands of years is even more difficult. To add to this challenge, Biblical Greek doesn't have any punctuation. In our weird world of texting unpronounceable gibberish such as see you late or raffle smiley face passing as communication, 
That may not sound like a big deal, but consider the comical example of two hungry kids shouting, Let's eat Grandma! Cannibals? <laughs> no, just poor grammar. Try it again, kids. Let's eat, Grandma! Much better. Even a lowly comma can save lives. So, even the slightest change can totally alter the meaning of a sentence. Another example of this are the following two sentences. They use the exact same words, but have the exact opposite meaning. And, sadly, they will have the exact opposite result in this person's life. I know that God is with us, but there is no way we can succeed. There is no way we can succeed, but I know that God is with us. Arriving at an accurate translation is also much harder when you, and the people paying you, already know, or think you know, what a passage says. I am absolutely not a biblical Greek scholar, but we don't have to be to clear up this seeming contradiction. Jesus clearly said that he had not come to abolish the law, and we have already said that there are no contradictions or errors in Scripture. We also note that Paul, the man writing this, says that he delights in the law of God, and that we do not overthrow the law, but we uphold the law. Therefore, if Paul is not contradicting both Jesus and himself, we need to find a better understanding of this verse. It is often recommended that we read difficult passages such as this one in multiple translations to get at the true meaning. However, that doesn't help much with this verse because almost every translation team agrees that Jesus did away with the law. The Good News translation even simplifies it more for us, saying, He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules. That is very easy to understand, but perhaps not correct. So let's take another look at that verse. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two. The Greek word that is translated by abolishing is katergesis, which is Strong's word G2673. One meaning of this word is to abolish but the primary meaning is making inoperative. However, even if we substitute that into the verse, it still looks like Jesus made God's law inoperative, which is pretty much the same thing as abolishing it. Way back when I was in school, my English teacher said to never exceed eight words in a sentence because it can be confusing. Apparently, I didn't learn very well because that last sentence had 24 words. Paul, or at least the translators, must have totally skipped that class because the sentence we are examining has a whopping 67 words. And yes, it is confusing. So let's work through it carefully. What exactly did Jesus break down? He broke down the dividing wall of hostility. Did he break down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing God's law? One might think so if they assumed that it was God's law which created the dividing wall of hostility. After all, in Acts 10.28, Peter told the Roman centurion, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. <laughs> that sounds pretty hostile. Although Peter said that it was against the law, you will never find such a law in the scriptures. That was an ugly tradition that religious leaders had substituted for God's laws. By contrast, God's law says, Therefore you are to love the foreigner, since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. God's whole purpose in forming the nation of Israel was to bless all the nations of the world. God told the people at Mount Sinai that they were to be a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. 
To be holy means to be set apart for a special purpose. And priests mediate between God and man. Therefore, Israel was set apart for a mission to bless the entire world by being a living demonstration of God's loss to the nations. One reason that Israel failed in that mission was that they began to despise the Gentiles. You can't teach people about the love of God when you hate them. The walls of hostility that they built made the law of God inoperative. Oh, wait a second. Isn't that exactly what this difficult verse is saying? For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that made inoperative the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. Jesus broke down the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, which had crippled the law's ability to bless. Having broken down that wall of hostility, he could create one new man, bringing his people back together. And that is exactly what Paul wrote in Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. With that understanding, now when I look back at that passage, I can see all kinds of phrases that confirm this. Paul said that the Gentiles were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and were without God. That is exactly the situation of the northern kingdom we see that Jesus has caused the hostility to cease and has made us one again. We are no longer strangers because our citizenship has been restored. And now, joined together, we grow as a holy temple in the Lord. Wow, that was a lot of work, but it is so worth it. If we are to build our lives on Scripture, we absolutely must understand what it is saying. In Paul's letter to Timothy, he said that we must learn to correctly handle the word of truth. I want you to have the confidence that you can study these things out for yourself. I am certainly nothing special, but as James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. At the beginning of this chapter, we noted that the Law of Moses was specifically directed to the people of Israel. Similarly, every verse in the Old Testament describes God's dealings with the people of Israel. We also saw that the New Testament says that disciples of Jesus are grafted into the people of Israel and become one with them. However, due to almost 2,000 years of tradition, most Christians have been taught to ignore the vast majority of the Old Testament. By doing so, they have effectively removed over 75% of the scriptures from their Bibles and sadly have distorted the meaning of the remaining 25%. If you have taken this chapter to heart, your Bible may suddenly be four times larger than it was before. That is cause for great rejoicing. However, it can also trigger other emotions such as fear and even despair as you realize that you have been ignoring and even teaching against a large part of God's Word. Nevertheless, fear not. Listen to the words that Nehemiah spoke to a group of people who are in the same situation. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, from early morning until midday. The ears of all the people were attentive. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, 
Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, the Levites helped the people to understand the law. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who is the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, and all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This small band of people had recently returned from 70 years of exile caused by the sin of their parents and grandparents. They had lived in a pagan land all their lives, and most knew very little about the laws of God. This gathering was on the Day of Trumpets, which reminds the people that the Day of Atonement, Judgment, is only ten days away. As they heard the words of the law, they wept because they realized how sinful they were. Yet notice that Ezra and Nehemiah calmed them, saying, And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord? Yes, it brings God great joy when His people seek to learn and to walk in all His ways. And when they do, He promises to establish them. As Paul wrote, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. When we turn to the Father in humility and openness, we simply cannot fail. Many people like to pluck nice-sounding verses out of the Old Testament and talk about claiming the promises of the covenant. The problem is that they have been told so many times that the blessings of God are unconditional, that they cannot see that Scripture clearly states that these covenants are conditional. In the next chapter, we will examine the covenant that God made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai and the new covenant that He promised through the prophet Jeremiah. If all of this is coming at you too quickly, do not be alarmed. I was a hard case, and it took the Holy Spirit more than a year to convince me that what I was seeing was real. There were, of course, many forces working against me during that time. It is just like the spiritual warfare that breaks out when the Holy Spirit is drawing a person to accept Christ as their Savior. During my year of wrestling, it was a single, gentle word of encouragement that brought clarity. If you need someone to talk to, please write to me at rick underscore arndt at yahoo.com. See you in the next chapter. You've been listening to Understanding the Foundations. This 15-part Bible study series is a production of His Word in Wood. The entire series is available on Kindle, Audible, and YouTube. If you would like to discuss anything in this study, or if you just need someone to talk to, please don't hesitate to contact me at rick underscore arndt at yahoo.com. If you would like to share this series with a friend as an illustrated PDF book or an audio, simply request it and I will send you a link. Thanks for listening.